Hello and welcome back to lesson two, part two of how to use a comparator mirror. If you remember from the first part, I'm painting this image of Robert Redford in colour. I've done another tutorial where I paint the same image in black and white. And I've, as you can see, numbered all my paints so that you can understand exactly how I'm working. I didn't do this much in the first video, but I'm going to be referring back to that a lot more in this video uh, as I begin to fine tune my image. At the end of the first part of this tutorial, I did say that the next stage was to blend all my areas of tone together, which is true, but I just made a decision that I wanted to fine tune that shape at the edge of the face, the profile of the edge of the face. So I'm using the technique I showed in the first video, using a moist, clean brush to manipulate the paint on the surface of the picture, because remember, because it's oil paint, it stays wet. And then I'm blocking in the last, uh, the last areas of highlight there with skin color number nine and then I'm mixing in just a tad a tiny touch of cadmium red base color number 13 uh, to achieve a slightly more pink version of that color for the top lip there and you can see how crude I'm being with these brush marks I'm not getting too het up about the details I just want to place more or less the right tone in the right place this uh, is a slightly yellower highlight tone that was mixed from uh, skin color number 10 with just a little bit of the cadmium yellow, so base color number 14. Now I'm using skin color number five, not only to block in that area of color on the forehead, but to push down onto the darker tone uh, that makes up the eyebrow. So I'm basically killing two birds with one stone. I think this gives you a fair example of how once a brush mark has been put down on the surface of a picture it can be left considered and then manipulated changed moved around either by adding more paint or by subtracting paint using the the sweeping technique i keep talking about now i've chosen to borrow a bit of that very dark tone at the edge of the face it's skin color number six just to put in some of the to begin to intimate some of the darker areas around the nose the shadow on the top lip and you'll see here the right eye this is all done in preparation for that first layer of blending so although things are quite coarse and messy at this stage um, once I begin to blend everything will begin to become more unified also worth pointing out, although you can't see it here because of the angle of the camera, that I've been using the comparator mirror the whole time throughout this process. I've been looking back and forth and I've been uh, painting quite stupidly, as I often say, by which I mean that I've taken my imagination and my inclinations out of the process. Uh, this is a good example again of how the comparator mirror is used, of how the actual process works. So I'm looking into the mirror there. And I've decided that I wanted to get the profile at the edge of the face just just right before I started blending. So I'm looking back and forth, I'm checking, and then actually I'm manipulating the paint that's already on the surface of the canvas. I'm sweeping that dark tone up into the light tone to give me that profile that I want. A good example there, again, of how you can manipulate the paint on the surface of the picture and how putting the brush mark down is just the beginning of the story. And now, finally, I decided it was time to blend. So I'm using my quarter inch synthetic sable uh, flat brush and I'm moving it in little circular motions, not letting it get too loaded with paint, moving it away and cleaning it, um, just wiping it dry, not dipping it in the white spirit every 15 or 20 seconds. And that enable, enables me uh, not to, to blend without muddying up my colors too much. You can also see that uh, it's possible to adjust some of the finer elements of shading. Uh, you can see there I borrow a bit of that dark tone from the background. I place it in and then I wipe my brush clean and then I blend that through as well. I include it in the blending process. And because I'm still using the comparator mirror, I'm seeing other areas that need to be subtly adjusted as I'm blending. So why not adjust those as well? Here I've included a little bit of skin color number six uh, with the hog's hair brush, and I'm just blending that through as well. Now I'm thinking about what I called in the previous video anchor points or areas of uh, medium detail, which will begin to bring the picture up to the next stage and allow me to get an idea of 
um, how to push further on with the picture. Because I'm using a finer brush, the marks will necessarily be more refined, but I'm taking probably only as much care as I took with the broad hog's hair brush. It's, it's the size of the brush and the shape of the brush at this point that's giving me that finer level of detail. I'm not actually being any more rigorous with the way I'm placing my marks. Over time, you'll get a sense of what you can achieve with each particular brush, and you'll end up with brushes that suit your way of painting, your way of thinking through the brush better. Personally, I think filbert brushes give you the broadest range of marks. If you use it sideways, you can get a really thin sliver of paint, ideal for that slip of shadow in the eyelid there. Although, look at this, when I tried to refine it by removing paint, I actually removed all of the paint. But I remembered not to panic. I could borrow a bit from the forehead or perhaps even from the cheek and repair what I'd done. I probably will come back and tweak that again later. But for now, I'm going to think about something else. I'm going to try and adjust that highlight on the nose by removing paint. I think perhaps a less experienced painter might see a hiccup like that as a sign of inadequacy or, you know, take it as a failure. Well, I have to tell you that failure or making mistakes is an inherent part of the process. Paint wants to misbehave all the time. And from my experience, I would say that actually enjoying your mistakes, knowing that they can be undone and reworked any number of times, is what makes you a really lyric or a really painterly painter in the end, I think. Um, this is another example. Um, so I'm trying to get the details of that right eye, but the problem is that I've put, I think I've put too many dark tones in too quickly. And no matter how much I manipulated the paint and moved it around, it was just becoming muddy and dark and, what can I say, inelegant. And so I went right back in, I took all the paint away and then started working again from scratch. And actually doing that and then redoing it taught me a lot more about how that eye sits within the head uh, than getting it exactly right the first time. As I put those highlights in, you can see that the face really seems to begin to pull together. So as I do that, let me just spin out a thought. I just keep thinking back to that line in Tim's Vermeer where he says that if he keeps pushing the paint around under the surface of the comparator mirror, his painting always ends up looking like a photograph. And I can see that that's exactly right. But what I've seen is that if you team the comparator mirror up with an experienced painter, you end up being able to do something really interesting. And that is that you can explain the nuances of paint, the way that paint can be used to make a poetic image, an image that seems to resonate with life, uh, to people with relatively little experience of painting and relatively low confidence. If we take a close-up look at the cheek here, you can see that because I blended with small circular motions and sometimes that coarse hog's hair brush, it's left little stippled um, wave-like marks in the paint. I wasn't really expecting this, and it doesn't appear in the photograph, so technically we could call it an error. I've worked in photorealist painting studios actually where this sort of thing would be considered a first layer. And the whole picture would be reworked with another layer of perfectly blended, photographically finished oil paint. But here I want to create a painting that gives you a likeness from two or three feet away, but which on closer inspection is clearly handmade. It has a sense of soul. So I'm going to leave that stippled effect. The thing is, the more sure I become of my likeness, the more I can leave that purely technical process behind and start to think about how my painting actually speaks. So to spin out a metaphor, you could say that I've decided on the words to be spoken. I just need to consider how those words are spoken, the nuance, the inflection. And with this in mind, there are some areas that I want to keep free and quite gestural, like the hair there, and other areas that I want to uh, refine, like the background here, which I'm, you know, knocking back into one consistent tone, more or less. This is all part of the process for painting a portrait like this in any instance, with or without the comparator mirror. Once you've achieved a likeness, you then can start to think and make personal decisions about how you want the painting to operate. The difference here is that the comparator mirror has allowed me to show that plainly, without any false sense of mystique. Now, of course, painting is deeply mysterious, 
but achieving a likeness, which by the way is just the beginning of the process, is a purely technical challenge in which you isolate problems and solve them methodically one by one. If you remember, you begin by pre-mixing your colours and your tones on the palette before beginning to paint so that you can be reasonably sure you're in the right ballpark as far as colour and tone are concerned. And then you begin by placing those colours and tones with a broad brush and then blending them and repeating that process until you reach the level of finish and detail that you want. And then finally, I'd recommend doing this. I've taken the painting off the comparator mirror. I've got it up on the easel next to the photograph and I'm finishing it in a more conventional way. I'm thinking about how I want the painting to operate. I'm inventing areas of shadow there behind the head that aren't in the photograph, but which benefit the composition of my portrait overall. And what I try to aim for at this point is a feeling that the painting has become its own thing and that the photograph is really an accessory after the fact of it. Anyway, this is only a quick example, but I hope it gives you confidence and inspires you to paint your own pictures, whether or not you're using a comparator mirror. If you have any questions, please do get in touch at the email address here. And uh, good luck and happy painting. Thanks for watching.